All right, maybe Jam, you can do it first. That helps me if you're a pre actor. So then, and you do my arms, okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so actually, put your arms here, do it like that. <laughs> Drupal is people, Drupal is contribution, Drupal is community, Drupal is technology. <laughs> Drupal 8 is made by us for you. Thank you, everyone who contributed in any way to making Drupal what it is today. <laughs> you should, you should All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's do it again. Yeah. yeah? Right. Yes. Deal. Doing. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast: Drupal Technology, Community, and Business. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. There's a module for that? There, of course there is. In real time, right? Yeah. It's only, it's only days until uh, Drupal 8.0.0 is really, really going to come out. How are you feeling? I'm very excited. Um, I will say that we've worked on this for so long, and the idea that it's going to be released is going to be a huge relief on one side, but then um, you know, it will be a huge milestone for everybody in the community that has contributed to Drupal 8. So um, yeah, I'm, very, I'm very excited for that. Of course, the work doesn't stop there, no. right? <laughs> But um, yeah, the um, so I've been talking a little bit with the internet right. about about some things that the internet want to know, and and um, of course, every time there's some milestone, it's it's tempting to imagine that okay, now we're gonna you know take back, take back and All everything. Right. But um, for example, we've got uh, the contributed module repository to think about. We've got about the new semantic versioning and the point releases theoretically six months from now. Um, have you already been making plans for all that stuff? A little bit, yeah. Um, I will say that in my mind, the most important thing after Drupal 8 ships is the contributed modules. I really believe that the adoption curve of Drupal 8 will depend on the availability of these modules. So, you know, it could be this or it could be this, depending on, you know, key modules being ported to Drupal 8. So if people want to help, I think that's the best way to help. As it relates to core, we're probably going to go into a period where we're going to focus on shaking out more bugs. You know, we're going to find things once Drupal 8 hits production, you know, bugs, maybe some performance optimizations, things we can tweak and sort of dot more I's and cross more T's. Um, and that's also going to give us a little bit of a breather, so to speak, to kind of like, you know, um, relax a little bit right. and, uh, versus starting to build big new features the day after we release. Right. So you're going to have six months of shaking the kinks out, settling down a little. Right. Among the questions um, that have come up, uh, Gabor Hoichi and Daniel Veno were both asking about semantic versioning, a couple of different aspects of it. I'm personally very, very excited that we're not opening the Drupal 9 branch, you know, in two weeks' time, because I think that there is going to be incredible value in, in having the most hardcore core developers working on a living and breathing release and, and, and being able to take our feedback from the front lines of building applications and, and integrate it into a living release. So can you just, in a nutshell, for anyone who hasn't... Um, heard of it can you just talk about what it means that we're having semantic versioning and that we can add things to the uh to the the main version now sure i mean if you think about how we've done drupal releases historically they're sort of big bang releases like you know with drupal 8 we've worked on it for almost eight years and now we're about to release drupal 8 which is you know obviously great uh, but what that meant is that we haven't actually 
innovated in core, so to speak, or we haven't put out new versions of Drupal with innovative new features in almost five years, at least not in core. But in Drupal 7? In Drupal 7. And so you want to change that with the release of Drupal 8. And so the idea of semantic versioning is that every six months on a time-based schedule, we can put out new versions of Drupal, Drupal 8.1, 8.2, 8.3, and that these versions will have new features. Um, and then we would do bug fix releases as well, which would be 8.1.3 you know, or something. And so what that enables us to do is to keep innovating at a faster pace so we can add new things. At the same time, we have committed to trying our best to maintain backwards compatibility between these minor versions of Drupal so that it's a stable environment for organizations and that organizations can fairly easy or very easily move from one version to another and get new features, which in turn we, we believe will help accelerate the pace of innovation because you know, from a contributor's point of view, it's much more rewarding to contribute to a project if they can see their contribution in production right. within in, a in reasonable time. Six months or a year instead of years. five de- years down the road. So um, talk a little bit, extend a little bit on what you were saying. Talk about the vision for upgrades within the 8.x release cycle and the potential that we have to gracefully upgrade right into, you know, maybe a Drupal 9 in, in the future. Right, yeah. So the idea is we can add new things, but that we would maintain backwards compatibility of the code, but also the data. And, you know, that means either providing an, an API migration, or sorry, providing a data migration path. But it could also mean leaving the old API in place and adding a new API on top of what we have today. So it's, you know, adding more APIs and then Drupal 9 effectively could be us dropping the old APIs and, you know, switching to, you know, and just making the APIs that we've added the only APIs. Does so, that make sense? So, so, it, so it might mean that, it might mean that we're never going to have to do these gigantic rebuild upgrades uh, ever again. That's right. That would be, that would be ideal, where we can spread the innovations in smaller chunks. Uh, having said that, at some point we may have to make big changes. You know, changes that we cannot make through in a backward compatible way. Like you know, some of the things we changed in Drupal eight are pretty, you know, deep cuts, so to speak, in, into the into Drupal. Um, you know, things around how we build and deliver pages and, and these kinds of things may be hard to do in a Drupal eight branch. So they may have to wait until Drupal nine. So Eli T. Speaking of, of what you were just saying, Eli T asks, can you envisage Drupal undergoing this level of refactoring again? What could cause that? Uh, yes, yes, I could. Um, I wow, because my answer was, oh, please, no. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the, the success of Drupal has been the fact that we have made these sweeping changes and that we have reinvented ourselves many, many times and that we have kept up to date with you know, where the web is going. If you think about some of the systems that have died, you know, we don't talk about them, but things like PHP, Nuke, you know, Geeklog, Netware, these are systems that were stale and that didn't keep up with the pace of innovation on the web. And so for us to stay relevant, we have to keep moving. We have to make sure that we are, you know, the latest and the greatest. So, so it depends on, on how much we can pack into into the new feature versions as we go and, and what the web is doing, I guess. Yeah, I mean, if I think about the future of the web, I think it will look very different than what it looks today. You know, I imagine experiences going more omnichannel. Like I can see, you know, if you think about how would you, how would, how would the future look like? You know, I think about oral devices, I would, you know, even tactile devices. So how does Drupal play in a world where you can talk to a website or where a website can, you know, buzz your your wrist. Those are also the um, ultimate accessibility features, right? That's right. Um, if I think about how futures, uh, features are, you know, websites or experiences become more push-based, you know, they push information or services to you at the right time. You know, something that I've talked about a lot. Um, to make that possible, you need to be data-driven. So how does Drupal play in a world where there's a lot of data, right? the best experiences will be proactive. And to be proactive, we have to think about 
how does Drupal play in the world where there's machine learning and these kinds of things? And so I feel there's big changes to come. These changes may come fairly quickly. They may happen in the next you know, three years, five years. You know, maybe that's too fast. But And so I don't think we have the luxury of, of sort of kicking back and, and waiting or not changing anymore. So I think as things accelerate, we have to find ways to you know, keep up with that. And doesn't mean, and this is very important, it doesn't mean people have to work twice as much. You know, I think we have to find ways to scale our community such that it can be done in a way that's healthy uh, for everybody involved. So, I want your elevator pitch now. Like, 15, 20 seconds. Why does Drupal 8 matter? It's a good well, it's a good question, and the way I pitch it, it depends on the audience, to be honest. But I think Drupal eight matters because if I think about all the features, I really feel like you're at the right time, at the right place, in a world that gets more mobile, in a world that gets more personalized, in a world where content modeling becomes more important, pushing content to different channels. And if I think about all the things we did in Drupal, you know, from the authoring experience to you know, adding views in core to adding fields in core and improving the content modeling to restful services and being able to output content to multiple, you know, devices, if you will, or multiple channels. I really, really feel that from a features and functionality, Drupal has grown up quite a bit and that we will be able to be at the core of the digital experiences. And I really believe that we're at this point where we're going to move from, you know, just building websites to building much more than websites. And that's what I'm excited about, and that's how I would pitch uh, Drupal. Awesome. So, let's do a bunch of quick questions. Sure. Quick okay. answers? Quick questions, quick answers. All right. Paul Johnson. Hi, Paul. <laughs> so, the 19th of November is double special for you. What do you think about having the world's biggest birthday party? I think, it, I think it's awesome. I mean, it's in a way, it's the best birthday gift that I could wish for. And um, just to be clear, I didn't pick that date. I specifically excused myself from that discussion. Uh, <laughs> but the other court you know, committers All right. decided to put it on my birthday. All right. so. Let me be okay. the first to wish you happy birthday <laughs> and happy <laughs> Drupal 8. Oh, thank you. <laughs> ha! You win. <laughs> <laughs> Gabor Hoichi? wants to know if Drupal 8 is really only better for, for like enterprise-level websites. Well, it's definitely better for enterprise websites, but it's also much better for you know, small websites, even you know, for bloggers, frankly. If you think about what they struggle with historically is you know, usability, the authoring experience. You know, obviously, they also want to have a great mobile experience. So all of these things, we've, we've improved much in Drupal 8, and so everybody will benefit from, from these features. Excellent. Excellent. Um, there's a specific module that I've waiting for, but I've promised when it's there that I will move my own blog straight to Drupal 8, and that is like a very small site, so I'm, I'm excited about it. Gabor also wants to know if you expect that we'll be able to break into new markets, um, and which markets those might be, or whether we're just going to be serving our existing markets better. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll do both. Um... You know, I think Drupal is the ideal tool to help any kind of market or vertical or industry with their digital disruption. And in my mind, it's maybe not so much driven by Drupal. It's just about which industry is being disrupted. If I think about media and entertainment, their digital disruption started 15 years ago when you know people couldn't sell CDs anymore. Um, you know, changed the way music works. I mean, as you can see, even with publishers being disrupted. And so for these kinds of industries, their disruption happened or started and is still happening many, many years ago. And Drupal has been very, very useful for them. You know, almost, I mean, so many large media companies use Drupal. If I think about other industries, let's say high um, their digital disruption, in my mind, only started maybe three or four or maybe five years ago, like the way classrooms work the way you know teachers or schools engage with students it's, it's very very different or it's going to be very different and there's no reason to believe Drupal couldn't be at the heart of that and in fact you know already you know that's starting to happen 
And then other industries, maybe the financial services industry, the pharmaceutical industry, some of these industries, they're only on the verge of being disrupted, right? And so different industries are at different stages in the digital maturity model, if you will, and, um, and I think Drupal can help each of those. Right, and Drupal 8 is perfectly positioned to be there for them when they realize what they've got to deal with. That's right. Okay, <clears throat> Larry Garfield would like to know, uh, what are three use cases, markets, or target audiences that Drupal is a bad fit for and that we shouldn't work on? Huh, that's a great question, actually. Um, hmm, I think, you know, we still have room to grow when it comes to transactional, you know, solving transactional problems, like, you know, putting an e-commerce transaction at the core of Drupal can be a challenge. I mean, we can do e-commerce websites really well, but we have to integrate with a transaction engine. So I think there is a set of problems that are very transaction oriented that we are currently not a good fit for. Um, I think another set of problems that comes to mind is things that are very data heavy, like where you have to crunch, you know, or manage gigabytes of data, terabytes of data, you know, whatever it is. These problems you typically solve, you know, in a, in a separate application and that you integrate with Drupal. So it doesn't mean we can't solve real use cases there, just that we have to integrate with other applications, which, which is totally fine. So um, these are some technical limitations that I think defines what Drupal can and cannot do, or is or is not good at. So, but Drupal 8 is also, when you have the engine that is dealing with the big data, it's a great uh, middleman and even presentation layer and, and it you know manages the content and the output and it's API restful first now so it's in a great position to be uh, you know even an access manager or, or an engine inside the, uh, the, yep. the applications of tomorrow. Totally agree um, and yeah as you said Drupal will integrate with these systems and you can build great things with, with these kinds of integrations but I wouldn't move that data crunching into Drupal itself. Okay and would you let Drupal drive your self-driving car? Uh, probably not. Okay. <laughs> so there are three use cases that we're going to stay away from. Right. Klaus Puva from Austria uh, asks, uh, he says, you only made two Git commits touching code in 2015. Are you going to come back as a core maintainer or are you going to stay in visionary mode? I'd like to do both. I'll definitely continue to help provide direction. I'm very passionate about sort of that piece and sort of the product management, to use a corporate uh, term, aspect of Drupal and mm -hmm. figuring out where do we have to go, what does that translate to in terms of features and functionality. But I'd love to help, um, you know. He wants to get his I, hands dirty again. Yeah, I, I, miss, I miss the development part. Um, and so, you know, I dream about going back to, to writing code, which uh, the challenge is, is time. Um, and the even bigger challenge, to be honest, is you know, how do I optimize my impact? Like, yes, I can write code, um, and it's a lot of fun for me personally, um, but usually I find there's other things I can do, like maybe it's redefining a process, you know, redefining how we work, um, unblocking other people, or groups of people, or making, helping the Drupal Association you know, with things, I mean, there, I feel like there's a lot of other things that, that I can help with, which then unblock hundreds, sometimes thousands of people. And if I look at what I do and how I can optimize the impact of Drupal in the world, it's often not by me writing code, sadly. And so that's what's preventing me from writing code. I remember a thread on Drupal.org that got very, as they do, got very long and very upset and people were, um, we were talking about how to build taxonomies and where in the workflow do you put in, this is going to be hierarchical, this is going to be flat, this is going to be, um, because in Drupal 4, 5, we had to define how a taxonomy was going to be before we were allowed to use it. And then it was like that for all time. And there was a huge discussion about where in the workflow the site builder, administrative person to do that and several hundred comments in, you came in and said, 
let's just put logic in the back end that recognizes the structure that's being built as it's built. And everyone in the thread, like I imagine, went, oh, and an hour later, somebody posted a patch to do that. And it was like, so just like you said, you were unblocking, in this case, dozens at least of people who were fighting about a really key fee- functionality. So, mm-hmm. so I'm glad that you appreciate um, your, your value there. I'm sorry you can't have a little bit more fun in the code. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's all right. I still have a lot of fun. I don't remember this particular instance, but um, I've, I've made a lot of these kinds of decisions which don't involve coding. It just involves listening to everybody's opinion and then making a decision. And so I'll, I'll continue to do that for cool. sure. All right. Thank you. <laughs> So, 